I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I came from a close-knit family, even though I came from a poor family. But they gave me education with the instruction that this is the tool that will help me to dig my way out of poverty and ignorance. I came without a dime in my pocket. All I had were big dreams, determination to succeed, and the resilience. So coming from another country gave me that insight to be able to understand and deal with people from different backgrounds. I was walking into Kroger to pick up a prescription for my mom. Upon approaching the pharmacy, I slipped and fell in some liquid. I went to see my regular doctor, and that is when I knew that there was more going on from that fall. I then called Mr. Alawali, talked to him and let him know what was going on. I could just say that he, he's very professional and knowledgeable about what he does. He's very passionate about what he does, and he cares about his clients. I felt like I was a part of the Alawali family. The goal is to make sure that our clients will leave feeling that someone gets them, knowing that someone was able to be the voice for them. We needed an attorney because we needed somebody who understood the relationship between our case and the law. We had been through four different lawyers. We were very desperate. We knew from what we had heard that Emmanuel Alawali was the man, you know, who could take us through that experience and see us through and give us the kind of outcome we were looking for. For him, your case is personal. He gave us hope. He gave us encouragement, and we knew that we had found the right man that would see us through. Just know that when you're coming through the door, you're coming in through a place where you will be accepted and welcome as family, where you'll be seen as a person. At the Holloway Law Firm, we get you. We understand you. Trust us. Welcome to another interesting episode of Legal Angle with Emmanuel Dumah Alwali. My guest today is a tech guru. He's, he worked in Silicon Valley. He's also an author of Scaling Your Stupid Law Firm. He is the CEO of Legal Soft, a company that provides legal uh, virtual assistance to law firm. His name is Hamid Cohen. Welcome, Mr. Cohen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Uh, pretty briefly, I came to the country when I was 13 years old, which was a long time ago. I uh, went to college when I was 14, and I graduated for an engineering degree when I was 17 in California. And right after that, I got recruited to Silicon Valley at the age of 17, which I worked with some amazing companies and the great leaderships, Sun Microsystem, HP, Compaq, variety of different companies. I got my MBA there after about 20 years of working in Silicon Valley. I got recruited to Los Angeles, which I was the president of a company that was a public company. Um, and did that for a few years, a lot of international traveling and so forth. And I had some of my own companies that was in the area of the high tech that I created when I came to Los Angeles. And then a few years later, I got an opportunity to actually look into a law practice that my friend had. And I was asked to take a look and see what kind of a help I can do for the law practice. And once I got exposed to a running PI firm of, I don't know, what, 35, 40 people PI firm, and I found out there was a big discrepancy between where the law firms are in the way of uh, automation, uh, outsourcing technologies, innovative uh, marketing, and so forth, I saw a huge opportunity, and I tried to help those firms. And I did uh, became a sort of a, like a virtual COO for one law firm and then the second. And at some point I was a CEO of like six, seven different law practices. 
And then I came to the conclusion that it's just being the mastermind or a consultant and so forth is not enough. And we actually need to take on some of the responsibilities of implementing changes within the firms to bring them up to the latest, greatest technologies. That's how the legal stuff came about. And uh, we saw it was a huge opportunity because I, I always used to say, uh, if we left the law firms alone, they still will be wearing pagers and waiting at the fax machine for the next fax to come in. And that's how I sort of looked at it when we started this process of building a legal soft as a company. Thank you. Now you mentioned that you came to the U.S. at the age of 10. What was that transition like for you? I was, uh, age of 13 is when I came. And um, I only had my older brother here, which was about five years older than me. So he wasn't much older either. And it was a big transition because I came from a different country. And basically after I arrived a week later, I had to be enrolled in the high school. <laughs> and this high school happened to be a private Catholic high school in Louisiana, which is it's, it's, it's got its own flavor of things, not just landing in New York or California or Miami. Uh, ending up in Lafayette, Louisiana was a heck of an experience. But I met some amazing people in the school. They were so supportive. They're so understanding. They sort of took me in. They showed me the ropes. They helped me, you know, grow and expand and, and be happy. And I'll never forget those days where I was uh, accepted into the school and the community so nicely and, and was was a very good experience. That's awesome. And when you were making the decision about going to college because you were recruited at such a young age, how did you... I just you... followed up the procedure pretty much. I, I basically, I started as a, I think it was a sophomore or something. And then I found this song sort of easy and I went to the principal office and said, this stuff is pretty easy to me. What can I do? And they said, well, you can test out of it. And those days you could. So I took a test and I passed the sophomore and I went to the junior and did the same thing. And then I became a senior all in the same year. <laughs> I basically took the, took the final exam and they said, okay, well, you're done. Um, so, and then I took the, SAT, it was SAT and a ACT at the time. So I took it, and again, because I came from a Middle Eastern background, our science uh, curriculums are very strong over there, very much college level. So um, I did extremely well on my test because I had a very strong physics and math background, and the ACT at the time was very science oriented. So I scored really high. And then uh, one day, a US Air Force representative showed up, and I our apartment and say, we got a scholarship for you to join the US Air Force and, and we will give you an engineering scholarship. And I'm like, no, 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 I didn't come here to go to military or anything like that. I just want to study. So then I started applying for colleges randomly and got accepted and sort of got in the car, went to California, went to college. Wow. What was that college experience like for you, you know, starting college at the age of 17 and all this? Uh, I was used to having uh, older friends around me all the time because I, I was always in a different uh, age bracket with my peers. <clears throat> so it wasn't that difficult or that apparent that I'm so much younger. Uh, I sort of handled myself that way and I and it wasn't as difficult. And I was on the mission of I had to finish a school fast uh and being immigrants like really relating to yourself the means are limited the time is limited you have to make the best of every dollar every minute every opportunity so you're like okay why do i need my program in college because i was an engineering degree plus a computer science minor uh was a five year and i'm like why is it five year maybe i can i do it in two and they said not really i said okay i'm gonna try so I just did. I used to take like so many classes at a time and then they would bring me to the dean's office and say, hey, you cannot take 25 credits a semester. Maximum is like 16, 14. 
and I said, okay, and they said, we'll drop it for you. They drop it. I go back down and I add them again. Those days, things were not discomputerized. So they, they would catch you much, much later that you actually added a bunch of classes. So there was no computer system to track this stuff. Nowadays, you, you can't do this stuff. But I did that, and it worked. And every semester, every summer, I passed like three classes. Even on the, Remember even on the Christmas break, I didn't take a break, and I took a class. So I passed three more credits and four more credits. And then it comes end of it, and it's like, look, you're done. You shouldn't be, but you are. So, <laughs> you know, I got to go now because I already had a job before my graduation date. So I just yes. moved to, uh, because it was Northern California, I moved to Silicon Valley and started my job when I was 17. And nobody really at the time even noticed, cared, or asked questions. They were like, okay, so you have a college degree? Yes. You have a you're an engineer, yes. Okay, go to work. <laughs> so nobody asked my age really under the HR, and HR didn't care. So, so that's yeah, how you. Know. Know. So that was the process of getting into Silicon Valley after engineering degree. Yes, I can actually relate to that because I had a similar experience when I was in college. You know, I just breezed through college in three years, taking summer classes packing a semester with 26 credit, registering over the phone. <laughs> and right. by the time they caught it, it was too late. <laughs> exactly. It was those days you could pull stunt like that and, and and not get caught taking so many classes. So that's that worked for me for sure. What was your first year at Silicon Valley like, being a young uh, engineer? Believe it or not, uh, the first project that we had on was a motorized electronic typewriter. <laughs> that was the thing. It was like going from the manual typewriter. I know I don't, maybe I don't look it because I start so early, but there was going from manual typewriter to an electronic daisy wheel typewriter who could do also self-correcting typewriter. So that was the first project. And then... Um, after that, went to the company that basically, other than IBM, came up with the first uh, PC computer at the time. Uh, it's called Conversion Technologies, which was then bought out by somebody else. And then after that, I had a very interesting career because I worked for a company that actually invented laptops. It was called Grid System. And uh, they did the first laptops ever made uh, they patented the flip top. So every computer after that for 15 years that uh, the screen flips up had to give them loyalty. So I was involved with that company. And then I went to Sun Microsystem, which one of the first originator of Unix workstations and Unix servers. I was there for about eight years. Uh, variety of different experiences, but all of them amazingly good, amazing companies, amazing people to work with great leaderships, and it was a it was sort of extension of learning from college in practical environment. You also got to work with the CEO of Google. Yes, his name was Eric Schmidt. He's not chairman of Alphabet. He was a VP of uh, software development at Sun Microsystem. And then he moved on in several different positions. Great guy, uh, amazing visionary. And then he went to work for Google, where he made, in my opinion, he made Google what it is today. And uh, I had the pleasure of working with him for eight years at Sun. And even several other CEOs of like Yahoo, several of uh, uh, different other companies came from Sun because he had a good talent pool and had a good uh, process of creating leaders in the high-tech industry and it worked out really well and when you decided to start little soft what actually inspired you when did you know that this is the right time as i went to uh, help one of my friends who has a law firm and basically was asking, knew what I come from technology and, and uh, big infrastructure and the scaling and corporate world. He wanted me to take a look at his practice. So I went and looked at his practice and I found out a lot of areas for improvement, a lot of areas. So I started suggesting 
what he can do to improve his case generations, his intake, his case management, different software automations and so forth. And I made a full recommendation. And then he asked me, he says, well, can you help me do them? And I said, okay, sure. At the time I was running uh, another software company. So I had some free time and, and it was exciting to actually examine a new field. So I started changing the intake process, implementing a lot of different technologies for automations, document collections, um, uh, increased the case numbers by like 30, 40%. In, reduced the time from retained to settled by like 30%. And as we were moving along and growing the firm, one of the big things that came out to think is that none of this stuff is located in one place. So I had to deal with like 10 different companies. One does websites and SEOs. The other one does lead generation. The other one does social media, all these other companies. And then that was the first uh issue and the first challenge and the second part was lack of a staffing every time i wanted to hire people we we're in los angeles california so it was amazingly difficult to find qualified candidate that you can afford and they are reasonable in cost and their performance so i started looking into outsourcing so we created a separate different marketing program for the marketing side and we started looking at outsourcing and i didn't see anybody out there who can provide us the human resources that are trained for this environment. So that's how we started LegalSoft and we broke it down to two segments. One is the practice growth, which we do everything that you would imagine to do to grow your practice from online presence to lead generations, lead automations, conversions, client retention, referral networks, all of that. We cover in a one shop, you know, one stop shop, uh, they're very reasonable price. Every, everything I mentioned, it costs less than three or 4000 a month to have for that offer. Then the second part was a staffing. Pandemic happened, and the human resources availability got 10 times worse. And every law firm that I was working to expand and grow had to slow down and stop because of lack of human resources. So in LegalSoft, we started recruiting abroad. So we went, starting from Philippines, we went to Philippines, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, variety of different countries, which we now have offices in seven different countries that we recruit, train, and deploy a staff, virtual staff, into law practices. Now we are basically can outsource globally. So these are dedicated, full-time, bilingual, virtual staff that we train on your specific practice area and we put them into your environment as a full-time staff and is amazingly scalable. So anything from intake, from medical record retrievals, case managers, demand riders, all the way to folks who are attorneys in other countries who work here for the law firm as a paralegal or associates, obviously they can't practice law they can make you no know, legal recommendations or sign you know um, documents, but they can do everything before that. So they're an amazing tool for the law firms. And it's not just personal injury, it's a variety of different practices from transactional law like bankruptcies and estate planning, all the way to class action employment and mass tort. So we do all of those positions. The prices ranges from 2000 to like 2800 a month full-time as a 1099 to LegalSoft and is amazingly scalable. So what happens is that you get two intake people and now you want to add two case managers, one call, we basically line up a folks for you, who you interview, you select who you want, and then we train them, deploy them, and we continuously train them for that job. Um, and the way we treat our virtual staff is like in-house, if not better. We provide them medical insurance for them and their family. We give them a retirement account. We give them continuous education. We give them immigration assistance if they need to visit the US. We capture their screen every 15 minutes. We record all their calls that is accessible to the law firm. And we know exactly what they do, when they do it, how they do it. And all of that is transparent to the law firm itself. Thank you. 
um, what challenges did you face when you first started, you know, going into these other countries trying to recruit staff? Well, we have uh, in each of those countries, we have what we call talent acquisition teams that they basically post positions. They they run job fairs, their their partnerships with the colleges and so forth. So it's almost like a whole recruitment in, in each of those countries. We have physical offices in each of these countries. We have recruiters, trainers, success managers. We even go as far as identifying we provide um, position coaches to our virtual staff that coaches the uh, the candidates and it becomes the virtual staff. They coaches them how to improve themselves, how to grow, and how to expand in the positions. So we actually have uh, on location coaches for the VAs that we deploy. On the other hand, we have success managers who work with the law firms trying to to expand their operation, help them expand their virtual staffing and the process automation. So we basically remotely help all of this law firm to expand and grow their practices. Uh, you remotely help law firms to grow their practice. Uh, tell us a little bit about your onboarding on on process when you retain and hire this virtual staff. Sure. So uh, we get about 300 candidates a day. <laughs> so if you can imagine, there's a tons of interviewing in the screen going on, 300 a day, and it keeps growing. And all of that, there is a first level of screening that we do. Then we do some tests and we screen them further. Then, then they were selected. They go through the onboarding. Uh, they get paired by the firm position that have available once that is selected and you have selected your virtual staff that you want to bring on board we do a couple of weeks of extensive training on the position that this virtual staff going to have like for example if it's a case manager position in a personal injury firm we train them on that we train them on the case management software that the firm uses we provide them with a with a uh, with a computer with a high-speed internet and the working environment if they want to come to our location in that country and work out of the office or work from home. And so we do a complete onboarding and we check on their attendance daily to make sure they are fully attending the job. Uh, and that's the, when the onboarding happens and we once a week we connect with them to check the status of their work with the firm that they are assigned to. Every week you check to see they're actually doing the work with the firm they're assigned to. So how do you ensure the seamless integration of this virtual staff with the law firms to which they are assigned? Good question. What we do is that we, we have to train both parties. We have to train the folks in the local uh, law firm to how to treat and manage and coordinate with the virtual staff like this. So we, the training goes both ways. We're telling them, look, make sure the position is very clear and described. Make sure the assigned tasks to the VAs are very clear with precise deliverables. Train them to do the way you like to have the work done and get the end of the day report from every virtual staff to make sure that they are meeting your needs. So the training goes both ways. And we do the same thing with the virtual staff to say, ask for a specific directions and instructions and guidance. And if you have any other questions that LegalSoft can assist you with, bring it to us. We have legal experts in-house in most practice areas that we can actually help the virtual staff to do a better job at the firm that they're assigned to. So, uh, so in what ways have you been able to uh, connect the virtual staff with the law firms to ensure that there is measurable growth? Well, we have a platform where everybody sort of logs into and so they can assign the task. But usually, I mean, in some cases, we have a law firm which has a big monitor on the wall and they have like 10 of our virtual staff on the Zoom eight hours a day 
that they communicate with. It's almost like when you look at it, it's like all these 10 people sitting in your conference room and working together, which is a pretty cool scene when you see it in action. In average, we have about three virtual staff per law firm that we work with. We work with about five, 600 law firms. And we add, I don't know, about 100 a month right now. Uh, and anybody who tries it basically comes across to say, look, I don't know why I didn't try this before. I should have tried it before. I've been waiting to get that perfect candidate. And from that on, they like, where else can I use a virtual staff in my law firm? I tried it for the intake. Now I want it for case manager. We're doing a tons of demand writings right now for the PI firms and the workers' comp firms. So it expands. I, we have law firms who have over 40 virtual staff placed in their practice yeah, and over growing. 40. Over 40. That's awesome. So how do you balance the hours, the needs of the hours that the law firm needs and the hours of the virtual assistants? taking into consideration time difference? Well, it is interesting in these countries that we operate, the large group of the community have been living based on the US time zones. And they're completely operating in this time zone, which is kind of amazing. It just goes to show you how flexible they are and how cooperative they are to basically change the entire lifestyle by working US hours and sleeping, you know, our hours, which basically look like they're living in the US. And it's amazing. I still to date, we have thousands of virtual staff. It still amazes me how easily they adopted to this system and how long they've been doing this. And this is another uh, amazing uh, effect when you get one of these virtual staff working for your firm that you are so impressed about how grateful they are to have the job versus other issues we have in the US where, you know, I'll, I'll go as far as saying being entitled here versus being grateful. And people get amazed how grateful our virtual staff are by working in the firm and getting the incentives, getting the pays is, is really refreshing. The difference between being entitled and being grateful. Yes. Wow. yes. That's big. And given the sensitive nature of legal work, you know, uh, confidentiality, attorney client privilege, how do you balance that with having people work, working remotely with law firms who are, by law, have to, keep, have to keep confidentiality and privacy? Sure. It is interesting that you ask that because. Um, you, you have much greater risk when people are in U.S., different cities, different states that work remotely, and nobody asks that question. Just because they're in U.S. doesn't make their, their work environment, their computer, their connection any safer than somebody in Philippines or, a, or Colombia. But everybody, when you're leaving the U.S. work ground, worries about the security and safety. I wish they had the same concern about their local staff. And during COVID, we figured out that everybody can work from home kind of a situation. Government is a private job or a government job and so forth. And nobody ever questioned the safety of that. But having said that, we have taken a lot of measures. Our client, our VAs signed the NDA, signed it, uh, non, both the NDA and the confidentiality agreement because we have legal representation in all of these countries. So they take it very seriously, number one. Two, they are not allowed to save any data or information on their local systems. We monitor that. We screenshot their computers every 15 minutes to see what are they doing. We record all the calls and we track every URL that they visit. Try to do that with a US employee and see how many of them last. <laughs> you know, you're basically gonna be a completely virtual law firm because nobody, nobody in the U.S. is custom to put up with that much control or that much oversight. Uh, but we do that. And uh, we assign them the phone numbers and everything. So working this virtual staff with our system and our infrastructure overseas, I believe is much safer than folks working in the U.S. remotely. Thank you. 
And for a law firm who, let's say, for instance, is not happy with the staff they picked, how do you address that situation? First, we try to resolve and see what the problem is. Is it a problem with the training or instructions or the process? But there is no long-term contracts, so they can immediately request a change in the virtual staff we, or terminate whatever they're comfortable with. But usually we just place them with a new staff, more, uh, more tailored to their need and their practice. And there is, again, there's no long-term commitment because we want to make sure everybody's happy for keeping their virtual staff intact. We don't want to force anybody into a situation where they're not getting the service that they, they expect. Thank you. Can you share with us maybe um, one or two success stories of clients you have started to or able to scale their practice just by working with LegalSoft? Sure. Actually, I'm actually right now visiting one of them in Los Angeles. This is a PI and a Lemon Law firm that I engaged with about four years ago. There are two partners. Uh, they had about 10 staff when we LegalSoft engaged with them. Uh, and in combined, they probably were doing 20, 30 cases a month. Right now, they have over 120 staff. They have about 35 virtual staff. And they sign up several hundred cases a month. Uh, and now that I've expanded to outside of California to be able to take cases on into other states. So where I'm sitting right now, which was a small office, now they pretty much occupy two floors of a high rise. Uh, so this is one success story. Uh, I guess I can even point out to the uh, name of the firm. <laughs> Quillanero. So that's where I'm at today, visiting to find additional expansion opportunities for the firm. Um, other firms, we've done employment firms, again, the same situation. We specialize in a scaling. So we basically tell the attorneys, you practice the law when we practice the business of law for you. So you don't need to become a marketeer, the campaign manager, the uh, the staffing, uh, the automation, the IT, now AI. I just, by the way, you mentioned about me publishing the book, How to Scale Your Stupid Law Firm, that is on Amazon. And the reason I called it a stupid, because when I was coaching, uh, when after a few sessions with a client, the most common word came out was stupid. So it was like, my stupid intake, my stupid marketing, my stupid lead generation company, my stupid IT, and I, it did stay common for a variety of different clients that I talked to. So when I went to write the book, I tried to find the common denominator between my conversation and the word stupid came out. So that's how I called it. And I just recently, like a week ago, um, published a new book that says how to scale your stupid law firm, but I crossed the stupid and put AI under it. So that book is all about the impact of AI in any law practice from lead generation all the way to trial preparation and how the AI will impact every segment of the law practice. Thank you. So you have a new book out, how to scale your AI practice. Right. That's right. awesome. So how have you been able to leverage your background in tech to you know, integrate that into effective communication between Microsoft and their virtual assistants. Well, you know, it's all technology based. It's like every successful venture that you see out there, anything from, you know, the Facebook to Walmart to, you know, even the food industry and everything, is it is the implementation, proper implementation of technology is what makes the venture successful. You basically, you need to work everything off of metrics and you need technology to be able to track and monitor the metrics. You know, when we do some of these metrics within the law firms, we do everywhere from how many leads you generated, what was your conversion rate to take the lead to a case, what was the cost of your client acquisition for each of those cases, then goes from there into what's the 
average time from uh, retained to settled on pre-litigation versus litigation, how many cases in a case manager should or can properly handle, what's the turnaround on your medical records retrieval or any other document retrieval, um, how you get pre for depositions, all of this is technology oriented. And we teach our VAs the technology, we implement these technologies within the law firms, and we teach them how to operate the entire law practice based on metrics, not sort of a gut feeling. I think we're doing good. I think we're that my cost of client acquisition is a thousand. I think it takes about nine months to settle the case. Everything is a guesswork. And coming from the high tech industry, nothing can be a guesswork. You need to have hard facts, figures, numbers. That's how you operate. That's how you budget. That's how you plan. And that's how you implement. There is no guessing. There is no gut feeling. <laughs> there is no emotions, basically. Everything is numerically implemented. Because numbers don't lie. Right. Yeah, exactly. Don't lie emotion. And how have you been able to integrate artificial intelligence into Microsoft and connect with your clients? So artificial intelligence, the, one of the first things that is AI been able to do is properly provide the information on the intake process. You know, what is the intake process? Somebody asking the right questions from the clients about the right exact event that happened. If it's a slip and fall or is a car accident, is a motorcycle accident, is premise liability stuff. So how would you ask the questions? What questions are important and what's they're not? AI knows all of that. I don't need somebody guessing or making a mistake of not asking the right question or asking the wrong question. So here goes AI asking and screening the right questions. Then how you're escalating that is also AI deciding that I need, this is catastrophic injuries. This person is hurt. I need to get an attorney on call right now, passes the phone to the, you know, uh, uh, to the attorney, attorney talks to the client. Um, that entire process is can be AI driven process. The second part that if impacts the, the, the law firm, everything about your social media and online presence. Uh, what's the social media trend? Who are the followers? What's your demographic? What is engaging to the client or informative to the client? Again, nobody needs to guess about it. AI will figure it out exactly based on the practice type you're at, the state, county, the demographic of your clients, and will prepare content that you will post or they post it for you to be able to be engaging on your social media. Then you go into, for example, setting up the treatments. You know, based on the injuries that you just screening told you, what is the first level of treatments that you need to set up. So go to urgent care, go to emergency room, do the MRI, you know, do all of this stuff. Is again, AI can guide somebody through it so you don't have a difference between a you know, junior case manager versus a senior case manager. So there are so many different aspects of the law practice or any professional practice really, is that AI can eliminate the labor work that is, hasn't been so accurate or on, you know, on point and doesn't learn as fast as the AI does because AI is a machine learning system. So its capability to learn is 10, 100x more than anybody can do. And it has access to the huge amount of data to be able to learn and make decisions. Thank you. So how have you integrated that AI system into the services you now provide at Little Stop. Sure. So I'll give you one example. We are recently doing, uh, for the past several months, we're doing a lot of uh, demand writing services. And again, demand writing is, is kind of a straightforward, especially for pre lit cases, where you're taking all the medical records, medical bills, all the injuries. You're analyzing it, you identify the injuries, 
the loss of income, future pain and suffering, and all of that, and putting it into a demand for the adjuster to review. Well, about right now, 90% of that work that we do is via the AI, and the 10% is when we have in a local legal expert to review the document and submit it. So imagine instead of writing one demand an hour, you can write 10 demands an hour with this AI implementation. Thank you. And how has legal soft handle the potential language barriers between American law firms and the countries and which you retain your staff from? Uh, how do they relate to them? Good okay, question. That's the question. You know, how do you handle the potential cultural differences between American employees, I mean, American employees, law firms, and foreign employees? That's actually one problem we haven't had at all because the firms here are so diversified in in culture and nationalities and languages and so forth. That's definitely one problem we haven't faced yet. They, in average, there is five different nationalities work in the same law firm. So when we add two more, is just looks very normal. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've already answered this with the AI question, but where do you see the future of tech in relation to law practices? Well, um, all the lower valued staffing and labor is going to get replaced with the AI. That's first mentioned. Uh, people who are answering phone calls, people who are collecting documents, people who are writing content, all this sort of a task and jobs will go away. And especially in the transactional law, which is immigration law, bankruptcy, uncontested divorces and family law, estate planning, all of these areas where there is not a, a lot of, I hate to say this, lawyering. It is, is creating content, filling out applications, submitting application, getting the results to the client. Most of that is going to be taken care of with the AI. I can give you immigration form right now with the attorney that answers all the questions in the immigration form. There could be family immigration or business immigration. And if I give that to two separate immigration attorneys, most likely there is 15% of the answers different from one another because somebody wasn't sure about that answer. What's the best answer for that question, right? Well, AI is going to give you 100% because it already has a track record of a million other applications of such that has been submitted. And what that had the highest rate of acceptance with that answer. So it's going to say, look, for this application, basically, this is all the perfect answers. <laughs> so use it. It's almost like having a cheat sheet from when you go to college from the same professor who gave the same test exam out for the past 10 years. The people coming the 11th year, they have all the old exams, so they pretty much going to ace that class because they don't have to figure out any answers. The answer is already provided. So that's what's going to happen with the AI and the transactional law. Thank you. And how can people contact you or get in touch with LegalSoft? Uh, LegalSoft.com is our website. Um, my email is H as my first name, initial H, Kohan, my last name, K-O-H-A-N, at LegalSoft.com. I'd be happy to receive any communication. And if they call LegalSoft, they can also get a hold of me. And I'd be happy to speak with anybody who is interested to talk about the practice of law. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you on the show and answering all these questions with intelligent answers. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And for those of you watching and listening to us, we thank you for your time as well. Until next time, stay tuned for another interesting episode. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, and on YouTube. Bye for now. Thank you.